All right, a very good evening, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to the NCC Grace Academy. Praise the Lord. And you are here for, to discover how grace transforms. All right, and I believe that as you sit in, as you open your hearts to the Lord, that we will discover and rediscover how the grace of God transforms us from the inside out. Whether you are a new believer, whether you just received the Lord last Sunday or a few Sundays ago, or whether you've been in church for 20 years or 30 years, or whether you're a pastor. In fact, just before uh, this session began, I was speaking to a pastor, all right, and he's an amazing man. Right? He actually has a ministry to reach out to the uh, migrant workers here in Singapore. All right? And he's a pastor, and yet he's here to rediscover the grace of God. And I was telling him, even for me, even though I'm teaching the class, I'm constantly rediscovering the grace of God. None of us can say that we have arrived and that we have discovered right, grace fully. Right? It's, it's a constant discovery and rediscovery. Amen? Praise the Lord. So right now, just uh, let us open with a word of prayer and let's just commit this session to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening, even as we are gathered together in person and online. Father, I thank you for all your sons and daughters in this house, all your sons and daughters in your family. And Father, this evening, Lord, even as Lord, we just rediscover the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as we rediscover the gospel of grace, I ask, Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will open every eye that you will open every eye and you will fulfill every spiritual hunger, Father. I thank you, Lord. Every spiritual thirst shall be quenched. So, Father, I just thank you. I just thank you that even if there are questions, whatever questions that they remain unanswered, Lord, in their hearts for even many years, Father, that this evening and even for next week, Lord, the next session to come, Lord, that there's, those questions will be answered in the mighty name of Jesus. So, Father, we just commit this time to you in Jesus' most wonderful name. May your Son, Jesus Christ, be glorified and magnified, and may your people be edified. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right. So, today we're here to discover how grace transforms. And uh, in fact, um, the, the next, let's go to the next slide. Right. So, just to be sure you're here for the right class. All right. Today we'll talk about the new covenant of grace. Right. What is a covenant in the first place? Right, the old covenant versus the new covenant, right? And why God replaced the old covenant with the new covenant, right? And to understand better the new covenant of grace. And as we understand better the new covenant of grace, right, we want to enjoy the blessings of the new covenant, right? Because when we go through challenges, when we go through situations in our life, when we go through trials and tribulations, sometimes we ask this question, or oh, am I, why am I not enjoying the blessings of God? Why am I not enjoying the blessings as a son? Or daughter of God, right? We want to enjoy the blessings of the new covenant. And we want to talk about how to remain under the new covenant because it's very easy for us to forget that we are under the new covenant, right? So we want to remain and abide under the new covenant of God's grace. Amen? Praise the Lord. Next. Right? So before we talk about the new covenant of grace, right? We want to know what is covenant in the first place. What is a covenant? So there are Two things here on earth that I can share with you that come closest to describing what a covenant is, to come closest to de defining what a covenant is, right? Number two, right? We start from number two before we go to number one, the closest thing before we talk about covenant itself, right? Number two, right, is a contract. I believe many of us here, we have signed contracts before. Whether it's a major contract, a business contract, whether it's an employment contract, or whether it's a contract with a mobile phone company, you're signing a contract. And before you sign a contract, you always want to read through the terms and the conditions of the contract. You want to find out what your benefits are, what your liabilities are before you sign the contract. Although I do know that some people, because they're in such a hurry to get their hands on the new iPhone or the new Samsung Galaxy Fold or Flip or whatever the latest phone is, that they just, you know, they, they just sign the contract quickly without looking at the terms and conditions so that they can get their hands on that phone only to realize that if you break your contract before the 24-month period, you have to pay liquidated damages or you have to, you know, you have to, you have to, there's a liability, right? So it's good, right, that we look through the terms and the conditions, our benefits and liabilities before we sign a contract, whether it's a business contract, whether it's an employment contract, whether it's a contract with a mobile phone company. So I think many of us understand what a contract is, right? So that is number two, the number two closest thing to a covenant here on this earth. The closest thing, in fact, is actually a covenant itself here on this earth is marriage. Marriage is a covenant. Marriage between a man and a woman is a covenant. It's a covenant relationship where both the husband and the wife, the bride and the groom, 
they look at each other and they make that mutual commitment that all that I am, my person, all that I have, my possessions, is yours. I give authority over myself, my person, and my possessions over to you. And it is a mutual commitment that they make to each other. And marriage is a covenant for life. Right? And those of you who are married, say, Amen. praise the Lord. Uh, the ladies say very, say much louder. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wonder why. Right? So brothers, husbands, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? So marriage is a covenant. Right? It's a glimpse of the covenant relationship that we have with God Himself. Right? So if you look at the Bible, if you look at the Bible, I, I know many of us now we have our electronic e-Bibles on, our, on the app, on our phones, on our tablets. But if you look at a physical Bible especially, if you look at the contents page, you'll find that the Bible is divided into two parts. Right? The Old Testament and the New Testament. All right? The Old Testament with 39 books and the New Testament with 27 books, total of 66 books in the Bible. So you find that even the Bible is divided into the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right? And Jesus came. Right? Jesus was born. Right? When Jesus was born, it's covered by right, the first four books of the New Testament. The three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Gospel of John. Right? So when Jesus came, it signaled, right? it signaled the beginning of the New Covenant. However, the New Covenant was not yet cut until Jesus died on the cross. Right? But it signaled a, a, a turning point, a, a new beginning. Right? So the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the New Covenant. Okay? All right. So, so if you look at next, if you look at the old uh, covenant, all right, well, what was the old covenant all about? All right, if you look at the next slide, all right, the old covenant will, in fact, these are the two major covenants in the Bible. The other covenants, of course, but for the benefit of this lesson, for the purpose of this class, we'll talk about the two major covenants in the Bible, the old covenant and the new covenant. So the old covenant is also known as the Ten Commandments. We know the Ten Commandments, right, also known as the law, right? And the basis of the law, the basis of the Ten Commandments is do good, you get blessed. You do bad, you get beat. Right? It is, it is a basis that many people are familiar with. You do good, of course, you get good. You do bad, of course, you get beat. All right? And it's performance-based. It's based on our performance. It's based on how we perform. All right? It's a performance-based belief system, right? which realistically is not attainable. And I'll explain why later. For those of us who have been around in church, we probably know why already, but I'll explain it later. But it's a performance-based belief system which is not realistically attainable, right, for even the best of us, all right? So, that's the Old Covenant. The New Covenant refers to the grace of God, it refers to the gospel of grace, and grace is defined, or grace is defined as undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor of God, all right? It is a preferential treatment towards those who don't deserve it, all right? It's preferential treatment towards the one who actually least deserves it, all right? And you can actually, easy way to remember grace is God's riches at Christ's expense at the cross, all right? God, we receive God's riches, which we don't deserve, at the expense of the Lord Jesus Christ because of what He suffered at the cross on our behalf. So that's the new covenant of grace, all right? So in a nutshell, the old covenant is based on performance, performance-driven, performance related, right? And you do good, you get good. You do bad, you get beat, right? And the new covenant is based on grace, right? Undeserved, unmerited, undeserved favor, all right? Preferential treatment, right? Which we don't deserve. How good that is. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's, let's move on. So, if there was an old covenant, right? Why did God replace it with a new covenant, right? The thing we need to first establish is that very often we are accused of saying that, oh, we are against the God's law, right? We are against, you know, the Ten Commandments. Nothing could be further from the truth. God's law is holy, perfect, righteous, and just, right? We have the utmost respect for God's law. We have the utmost respect for the Ten Commandments, right? Because it is perfect, it is holy, right? It is righteous, it is just. Because God is a God of justice, God is a God of righteousness, in this world today, many people think they know what justice is, right? They fight for certain causes, right? Many people think they know what righteousness is and they fight for certain causes that they believe is right. But the only one who truly knows what is righteous, what is just, is the God of righteousness, the God of justice himself. So we have the utmost respect for the law because we know it is perfect, 
it is holy, it is righteous, it is just. Amen? But the only problem is, the only problem is what is holy, what is perfect, what is righteous, what is just, it cannot make you holy, righteous, and just. It cannot make you perfect. <laughs> so it's like a mirror, right? You look at a mirror, where well, you look at a mirror, and when you look at a mirror, all this while, you thought you were very good looking. All this while, you thought you were Mr. Universe. You thought you were Mr. Universe caliber, you know? Or you thought you were Miss Universe caliber. After you got married, you thought, okay, I'm Mrs. World caliber. But then finally, after all these years, you get hold of a mirror, right? And this so-called Mr. Universe and Miss Universe wannabe or looks at the mirror and discovers, oh, that's really how I look. And they smash the mirror, right? But the mirror is perfect, you know? The mirror just shows you how you really look, right? The mirror tells the truth. The mirror is unbending. The mirror shows you who you really are and how you really look. But don't go around smashing mirrors. Right? It's not the mirror's fault, right? The mirror is perfect, but the mirror cannot make you perfect, right? And the mirror cannot make you look perfect as well, <laughs> all right? Contrary to popular opinion, all right? So that is the reason why God replaced the old covenant. That's the reason why God replaced the law. Even though it's perfect, even though it's holy, it's just and righteous, it cannot make you holy, just and righteous, all right? Next. So, if you look at the, so I believe your, the notes were sent to you, uh, I think earlier today, so you can actually refer to your notes, whether it's in the soft copy or the hard copy. Right? I won't be going line upon line, I won't be going page upon page. Right? So some of the things you'll find, some of the verses you'll find in the notes, right? some of the verses which are not in the notes, I'll make mention to you. All right? So, uh, actually, if you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 7, uh, chapter 8, verses uh, 7 to 8, Right, it's very clear. The Bible says, for if that first covenant, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant of law, right, if that Old Covenant had been faultless, if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. And then, verse 8 is very interesting because it says, because finding fault with them, God says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So God himself found fault with the old covenant. God himself found fault with the first covenant. Right? Because it's perfect, but it cannot make you holy, righteous, and just. Right? So God is the one who found fault with it. And, you know, if, if you look at uh, page 8 of your notes, right? it's not on the slides here, uh, page 8 of your notes, uh, there's a very interesting verse in James chapter 2, verse 10. That tells us that the Ten Commandments exist as a composite whole. If you break one, it's as good as breaking all. I don't know about the driving system in other countries, but in Singapore here, when I took my driving test, there's such a thing as immediate failure. Right? Sometimes when you make a mistake, you have a demerit of four points, two points here, four points there, six points there. Right? But there are certain mistakes you make which call for immediate failure. One of them is mounting the curb. And I had the blessing of mounting the curb when I took my first test. Right? It was almost perfect, you know. Every station I, I went to, wow, I could, I could park properly, I could signal and change lane. But finally, when I had to do parallel parking, somehow, I felt that my car wasn't moving anymore. <laughs> and then the instructor looked at me, I looked at him. They said, what are you going to do next? Hmm, maybe I'll just step on the accelerator a bit more so that I can park straight. And then next thing I knew, the car was lopsided. And then after that, I knew that was it. I had failed my driving test, right? So there are certain offenses, there are certain mistakes. Or if you go out on the road doing your driving test and you beat the red light, right? It's a red light and you don't stop. Immediate failure. So there are certain mistakes, certain offenses which call for immediate failure. You fail one, you fail all. No matter how well you did, no matter how well I did for my driving test the first time round in other stations, because I mounted the curb, I failed my test. Some of you may have similar experiences, right? So, in James chapter 2, the Bible makes it very clear, you know, that the law of God exists as a composite whole. You fail one, it's as good as failing all. Even if you keep the other nine perfectly, it's not like our exam system. You know, our test system, our examination system, if you get 90%, whoa, that's a distinction, right? You got 99 upon 100, wow, very good. If you got 75 upon 100, you still get an A1, right, for our... GCE O levels, our education system, right? It's the best grade you can get, an A or A1. Even if you get 75 upon 100, you know. But God is perfect. 
And when God gave the law, the law is also perfect. It demands perfection. You fail in one, you fail in all. And it's not just the outward performance. It's not just your outward actions. Because in, especially the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus made it very clear. That it's not just about your outward actions. It's not just about not committing adultery. If you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery. If you hate someone, if there's bitterness in your heart, it's as good as murdering someone. If you covet your neighbor's car, house, property, latest phone, it's as good as stealing. So God doesn't judge on the curve. God doesn't just look at the outward appearance and the behavior. God looks all the way into the hearts of men. God looks all the way into our hearts and minds, into our motives. So, so we may outwardly walk around, right, smiling at people. We may outwardly go around, being very friendly towards people. But deep down in our hearts, if there's bitterness, if there's envy, if there's covetousness, if there's lust, <laughs> we have already sinned. So that's how perfect God's law is. It's unattainable. It's unattainable. And if it can be attained, if it can be met, it won't be perfect anymore. Because imperfect men can attain to God's law. So throughout the course of history, not a single man, not a single woman can boast to have fulfilled God's law perfectly, except one. The Son of God, the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. Only one man has perfectly fulfilled all the requirements of God's law. Not just the actions, but every single area. Intentions, motives. Even his thoughts were holy. Not just the actions, you know. He didn't just go around healing the sick, raising the dead, performing miracles and doing good, but his heart was pure. His thoughts were pure. Everything about him is pure and holy and perfect. Only one man. And no other, no other will ever attain to the law. Only that one man, the Son of God Himself, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. So let's move on to the next slide. So the Bible tells us in Galatians, in the New Testament, and this is written by the Apostle Paul, also known as the Apostle of Grace. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 to 25, very interestingly, has this, he writes this scripture. And this scripture is very interesting because especially the New King James Version. Some of us read the New King James Version, some read the original King James Version, some read newer versions like New Living Translation. And it's very interesting because the New King James Version says, therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. When I read this verse previously, I used to wonder, why is the law our tuition teacher? You know, because in Singapore context, for those of you who are watching from overseas, and a shout out to those of you watching from overseas, uh, I know that the uh, majority of you come from India. Praise the Lord. I love Indian food. Woo! Right? And there are many of you from uh, Philippines, from Malaysia, from United Kingdom, from South Africa as well. Right? I hope this is your lunch break or I, ho I hope you took leave uh, or I hope you've ended work. Huh? Uh, I hope you're not doing this during office hours. Right? <laughs> if you do, well, okay, God bless you. And <laughs> right? So I used to wonder, why, why was the law our tuition teacher? Because in Singapore context, when parents are very... We don't, we're not worried, lah. we're just concerned. All right? When we're concerned that our children are not uh, catching up in their studies, when we're concerned that they're not uh, you know, achieving the results you know, that they are supposed to achieve, all right, we will hire a tuition teacher. Right? We pay their money so that they are the ones who will teach us, our children. Because when we teach our own children, somehow the emotions get in the way. Right? Because we wonder, how come an intelligent father or mother like me, all right, how come my child cannot understand this simple math question? When I'm so intelligent, how come you can't understand? Right? And we get emotional. Right? I, I can say this because I've been there before. So because I get emotional, I decided, my wife and I decided, okay, long ago, that we'll, we'll, we'll pay someone to teach us, uh, to tutor our child. So I used to wonder, why is the law a tuition teacher? Right? To bring us to Christ. Right? I, I, my idea of tutor was based on Singapore context. Right? Then, if you read the original King James, it says, schoolmaster, principal. Right, it's our principal, our schoolmaster. Certain schools, they, they have a principal, they have a headmaster, they have a schoolmaster, discipline master. Uh, okay, that one maybe makes a bit more sense. Huh? It's our discipline master, our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
But actually, neither is truly accurate. And interestingly, you read the new uh, international version or the new living translation, actually the, the word there is a bit more accurate actually because right in the original Greek, all right, it's actually the word uh, paidagogos. And in biblical times in those days, those, especially those who could afford it, those who are well-to-do, those who are wealthy, they would hire a paidagogos, right? A, a guardian to supervise their child before they became an adult. And in the Jewish uh, culture, you become an adult at the age of 13, not 21. <laughs> All right? For us, legal age is 21, right? But for them, right, the legal age is 13, right? Uh, rather, they, they become an adult at that age. So, so when your, your, your child, your son is still a, a child, right, you hire a paedagogos, a legal guardian, a guardian to supervise, to teach them how to behave. Right? And, and, and that, that guardian you know, was someone who supervised the child. Right? So that's the word that is being used here in the New Testament, which is written in Greek. So a, a guardian, a supervisor, right? not a tu tuition teacher. All right? And then it says, after faith has come, we are no longer under that paedagogos. No longer under that guardian, that supervisor. So yes, the law was the guardian. The law was the tutor or schoolmaster or supervisor to bring us to Christ when we are children. When we are children, right? When you are a child, when you, when you deal with a child, you have to tell them not to do this, not to do that because they don't understand any better. When you see a child playing by the side of the road, you don't just keep quiet. Especially your own child. But sometimes what we do is the opposite of what we should do. Because when you see your child at the side of the road, there's a car coming, we scream at them. And then they get a shock. They're standing in the middle of the road. So actually, right, sometimes we don't even do the right thing, even though we have the best of intentions. Right? But when you deal with a child, when you deal with a young child, you have to tell the child what is right and what is wrong. And that's the privilege of being a parent. For those of us who are parents, and those of us who will be parents in the future, the privilege of a parent, right? The influence of a parent, the authority of a parent is God given. God gives you authority and influence over your children to tell them what is right, what is wrong as a child. And of course, we base that on the Bible. What the Bible tells us is right and what is wrong. And we teach them to our children. We teach them life lessons even. We give them bite-sized portions of the gospel. Right? But when faith has come, when we become mature sons, Right? When, when, the, when the son be, grows into a mature man, he's no longer under that paedagogos, no longer under that guardian, no longer under that supervisor because they become a man. They become an adult. Right? And in the, in the legal sense, many of us, we identify certain countries is 18, certain countries is 21. When you reach a certain age, a legal age, you get to sign your own documents. You don't need your parental consent. I was just talking to one of the staff at the back just now before we began. You know, that for those who signed up but didn't turn up, right? I said, uh, make sure they produce the medical certificate or parents' letter. <laughs> because that's what is required in schools, right? If you don't turn up for school or you miss your test or examination paper, you have to produce either a medical, medical certificate or a parents' letter, right? Sometimes the parents' letter is not accepted, right? Especially for tests or exam that you miss. So you need a medical certificate, right? So, so if you are of age, you don't need a parent's letter. You don't need your parent's consent. You sign yourself. Okay? So after faith has come, we are no longer under that schoolmaster, that tutor, that guardian, that supervisor. So that's the role of the law. Right? For Israel. When they were still immature, because remember, the Savior had not yet come. The Savior had not yet come. So they were, they needed the law to govern them. They needed the law to show them what's right and wrong. But even then, even then, whether they were in the wilderness, whether they were slaves in Egypt, every step of the way, right, right before the law, during the law, God was still merciful towards them in many occasions. As you read in the Old Testament, we have no time to go through them. Right, there was, there was even glimpses of God's grace, God's mercy. That reveals God's heart, you know. Even under law, God was gracious and merciful towards them. Even though they were under the system of the law. But once faith has come, once Jesus Christ has come and we put our faith in Him, we are no longer under a tutor to guide us. So does that mean we live lawlessly? Nothing could be further from the truth. Alright, let's move on. So to understand the new covenant of grace, we need to understand what is grace, right? So next, 
I think earlier on we looked at the definition of grace. Undeserved, unmerited, unearned favour. Okay? And uh, let's move on. One of the favourite verses in this church of our pastor, right, is found in the Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 17. A beautiful portion of scripture. For the law was given through Moses, the servant. Moses was a servant. It was given from a distance. It was given... It was written on two tablets of stone. The law was given through Moses the servant. But grace and truth, eh, no E there, came through Jesus Christ. Right? It's not camera, huh? it's came. It's not a short form for cam, right? Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have been in church long enough, you find that this is one portion of scripture that Pastor Prince and the pastors expound on regularly. That grace and truth, if you look at the Greek verb, Right, it comes if it's in the, in the present tense. Of course, the past tense is came, right? But if it's in the present tense, right, it comes. It's singular. Grace and truth are one. It's not grace and truth are separate entities. Truth is on the side of grace. Grace and truth are one. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. The law is given from a distance. Grace and truth, the law is given through Moses from a distance. Grace and truth came. So beautiful. Grace and truth came in the person. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to love you. He came to save you. He came to heal you. And He wants you to just experience His closeness, experience His presence. That's so beautiful. All right, let's move on. So at the cross, Jesus, because He lived a perfect, sinless life, His thoughts were perfect. He knew no sin. He did no sin. In Him was no sin. And that's what qualifies Him to be our representative at the cross. He suffered the punishment and condemnation that we deserve to suffer. And the only reason He, he, he was qualified to represent us at the cross was because He gave up His majesty. Even though He's a Son of God, even though He's a second person of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, He, con he consented to be not just, you know, I, I even think of the conception of Christ as something so beautiful, so humble, so meek. He consented to be conceived in the womb of a virgin named Mary. Just think of that. He, conceived, he, he consented to be conceived in the womb of a virgin. So at that point of conception, how small was he? You know how small a fetus is when they are just conceived? How small was he? And for 10 months, 40 weeks, he grew in that womb. I'm sure space was limited. The one who created the heavens and the earth, you know, the ones who created the mountains and the oceans, who flung the diamonds, the stars, the, who, wow. And, and think of creation, how great and how majestic creation is, right? The creator of it all. He consented to be conceived as a tiny fetus in a womb and limited by space for 40 weeks before he was born. And even when he was born, he could choose to be born anywhere he wanted, being the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But in his humility, in his meekness, he chose to be born in a humble manger, in a dirty, stinking manger, where there was no space for him at the inn. It's a place where the animals would feed, a feeding trough actually. I used to think that it was um, made of wood. You know, some of the old uh, children's Bible illustrations, right? They, they put they, they had Jesus, uh, you know, was placed in a, a, a wooden bed. But it's not made of wood. It's made of stone. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it speaks to us about the reason he was born. Right? His first bed was a bed made of stone. He was wrapped in swaddling cloths. It's a picture of his death, his burial and eventually his resurrection. So that's why his first bed was not made of uh, wood, it was made of stone. Because when Jesus died, his body was laid in a tomb made of stone. And he was wrapped up in swaddling cloths as a baby. When he died, he was wrapped up in a linen cloth as well. So it's so beautiful, even in his birth, we see the reason why Jesus was born. And that's and because he, he, he walked on this earth for 33 and a half years, perfectly perfect completely holy, completely righteous, completely just, completely true. That's why he qualified to be 
our representative at the cross. You know, many of us, we know sports. You watch the Olympics, you watch uh, World Championships, World Cup is coming up at the end of the year. Football, I'm referring to football, right? Whatever sport is your favourite sport. And without naming names, whenever an athlete, whenever a swimmer, an athlete, a sports person wins the gold medal, they finish first, they win the gold medal. When it's medal presentation time, when they receive their gold medal, after that, uh, they don't play their favourite song, you know? They don't play their favorite rock song. They don't, they don't hoist their favorite t-shirt. What they play is the national anthem. The national anthem, the nation that this athlete, this sports person represents. Right? What they hoist up is the national flag. Not his favorite rock band's t-shirt. You know, not, not his favorite song. Why? Because this athlete, this sports person is a representative of the nation. So when you see the medal tally, that gold medal is added to that nation that won the gold medal because of this athlete. Jesus Christ was our representative at the cross. Bible language, our great high priest. Because the high priest of ancient Israel was the representative of the nation before God. So he's not just the high priest, you know, not just a high priest or one of the high priests that they had from, for the course of the history. He's the great high priest. The best that was, the best that is, the best that ever will be. Reminds me of a wrestler, but anyway. <laughs> That's what other days, you know. So, so he was punished on that cross. He suffered the punishment and condemnation for all our sins, our sickness, our disease, so that you would be blessed. Yeah. Amen? And you know what? I believe you've seen this video many times. You've seen it on a website. You've seen it in church service. And may, maybe some of you have never seen it before because you're new to us. Right? But I never get sick. I never get tired of seeing this beautiful video of what happened at the cross. So for those of you, whether you're watching for the first time or whether you're watching for the 2,700 first time, right, sit back and enjoy. God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, my God. 
your hands, I commit my spirit. So beautiful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, when you see Jesus bearing sickness in his own body, bearing your depression, bearing your death, he bore it all, bearing your sin on his own body. That is the basis of the new covenant. It's not at God's whim and fancy. Because that that dilemma in that sense was that God is gracious, God is love, God is merciful, yet God is righteous and just. So how can God accept sinful men into His presence? How can God reconcile sinful men to Himself when they have sinned? Because God's righteousness and God's justice demands payment, demands payment for our sins. Because we had a sin debt that we could never pay. And His grace and His love and His mercy, yet He wants to embrace us, yet He wants to be with us, yet He wants to bless us. But God, being all wise, all knowing, the infinite wisdom of God came up with this beautiful plan of sending His Son. And yet it took Jesus to consent to giving up His majesty, to be conceived in the womb of a virgin named Mary, to be born in a lowly manger, to live the first 30 years of His life in a humble carpenter's workshop. And then He embarked on His earthly ministry for three and a half years. And that's where He began to perform miracles. That's where He began to go about doing good, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, making the lame to walk. And then he died on that cross. And every step of the way, nothing that happened to Jesus was against his will. Nothing that happened to him was without his permission. The only reason why the mob could arrest him was because he consented. He allowed them to arrest him. The only reason why they could beat him up, they could pull his beard, spit at him, the only reason why the Roman soldier could scourge him, the only reason why the crown of thorns could be pressed upon his brow was because he consented to it. He allowed them to do so. The only reason why they could nail him to the cross was because he allowed himself to be nailed. And I love how it's depicted in the Passion, you know, where he willingly lay down on the cross to be nailed. They didn't forcefully put him there. He willingly lay down in order to be nailed to the cross. None of this happened or took him by surprise. He consented in love for you and for me. And that is why the new covenant, the basis of the new covenant of grace is not at God's whim and fancy. The basis for the new covenant of grace is perfectly righteous and judicial. All the requirements of the law perfectly met by the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. And that's why we get to enjoy. You know, in a, in a covenant relationship, when you make that mutual commitment to each other, to your covenant partner, that all that I am, all that I have is yours, what can we give to God? God has everything to give to us, but what can we sinfully bankrupt man, morally bankrupt man, sinful man, what can we give to God? The very breath that we breathe came from Him. Even if we give our tithes, even if we give our offerings, even if we give everything that we own, it all came from the Lord. So what can we give to God that He first didn't give to us? There's nothing we can offer to Him. And that is why the Lord Jesus Christ, as our representative in this covenant that God has cut with man, 
Oh, he has everything to give to the Lord, to the Father, to his heavenly Father. He has everything to give on our behalf, which we cannot give in and of ourselves. And that's why the Father is so pleased with the Son. The Father is so pleased with the work of His Son. The Father is so pleased that in a few moments' time, this was instituted for the church. They will remember His finished work through the partaking of the bread and the cup. To remind the Lord, to remind the Father of His Son's finished work. Not that He forgets, you know, He won't forget, of course. But He loves to be reminded. He loves to be reminded of what His Son has done. And to remind ourselves especially, because we will forget of His perfect love that He has demonstrated at the cross. And that is the basis of the new covenant of grace. That's why we preach so strongly about the grace of God. It's not anything goes. It's not at whim and fancy. It is perfectly righteous and judicial. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So how do we enjoy the blessings of the new covenant? You know, in Hebrews chapter 8, because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross, He died, He was buried, and on the third day He rose again, and He lives forevermore after the power of an endless life. And because of His finished work, in Hebrews chapter 8, God declares, this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. And not just natural Israel now, spiritual Israel. Because in the old, under, the, under the law, right, the, only the Jews get to enjoy God's blessings because the covenant was cut with Father Abraham. The covenant was cut with them, right, the, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. But in the new covenant, the Gentiles, the non-Jews, become spiritual Israel. We get to enjoy the blessings as well because we are the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Not natural, but spiritual Israel. So this is the covenant that He'll make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Right? Instead of writing the law on tablets of stone, He says, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. So beautiful. God is the one writing in your heart. God is the one writing His laws in your mind. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, the law tells you, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And there are men who boast, oh, I've never committed adultery. And then you look at them and say, I'm not surprised. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's not just about not committing adultery, you know. Some people don't commit adultery because no one will look at them or give them a second look. Some people don't commit adultery because they have no money. But the law does not tell you how to love your spouse, how to love your wife. And that's why in, in Ephesians chapter 5, the apostle of grace, the apostle Paul says, husbands, in verse 25, in fact, there's many verses, you know, verse 25 all the way to 33. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. So, the New Testament tells us Husbands love your wives. But it doesn't specify because every woman is different. Every spouse is different. But the law just says, do not commit adultery. And many people keep the law that way. They don't commit adultery. But in their hearts, in their minds, wow, there's a whole lot of things going on which you wouldn't want to put on screen. Right? But grace teaches you how to love your spouse. So while the Apostle Paul is very general, love your wives as Christ loves the church, how did Christ love the church? Sacrificially. So how do we love our spouse? Sacrificially. So if, Deacon David, your wife was her favorite food? Nasi lemak. All right, she has a craving for nasi lemak, right, at 3 a.m. Well, what is she doing at 3 a.m.? Anyway, right? Dear, uh, I'm, I want some nasi lemak. How you love your wife? Sacrificially. Right? You wake up, you put on your clothes, right, out of your pajamas and put on your, your, your shirt and pants and all that. Then you drive all the way out and you by the nasi lemak. For, for overseas uh, uh, friends, nasi lemak is rice with coconut, right, and sambal, and well, a lot of other good stuff. I can't quite describe in words. It's too beautiful. It's beautiful beyond description, right? But not too marvelous for words. That's the Lord himself. Hallelujah. So, so you love sacrificially. 
it, it, even though it means inconvenience for you at the, at, the, at the expense of your time, your energy, your strength sometimes, right? But maybe for another person, their wife may not like nasi lemak, right? Some people's wives like flowers, some don't. All of them love diamonds, I'm sure. Right? So there's different preferences, right? And, and grace will teach you. He puts his laws in your mind and writes them on your hearts. How to love your wife. There's no manual that teaches you. There's no book that will teach you. When my wife says this, this is what I do. Or when, my wife's, when your wife does this, how do you respond? Multiple choice. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. Maybe the education system teaches you that. Multiple choice. Of course, certain papers you have to write essays. But it doesn't always work the same way. Right? So another day, she might have a craving for something else. Does she like durian? Oh, I perceive she's a woman of God. The king of fruits, lovely. Just the other day, I was counseling a couple, marital counseling, and the wife was complaining about many things about the husband. One of the things she complained about, which I, I, I rebuked him for very, very strongly, was that he didn't like durian. So I said, you deserve it, like you. You know, you deserve all the scolding. <laughs> all right, so, so it's not always the same. And that's what makes it fun. That's what makes life with the Lord fun and exciting. That's what makes marriage fun and exciting. It's not so predictable. You know, it's not, it's not, oh, thou shalt do this, shall, thou shalt do that, or thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. It's not just about not committing adultery. It's about loving your wife the way she wants to be loved, the way that makes her feel loved. It's not about not murdering someone. It's about not just not having bitterness or hatred towards people in your heart, but loving them. Love not just your neighbor, love your enemy. Wow. Loving your neighbor can be really challenging enough, especially a neighbor who's inconsiderate, plays loud music at late at night, right? The neighbor that, <laughs> you know, you, you know what I'm talking about. You all have neighbors. Some of you have great neighbors. Some of you have inconsiderate neighbors. When I was growing up, my, my mom, who's since gone home with the Lord, had a very friendly neighbor two doors away. They love to have this competition of sweeping the drain water. Because there's this little small drain, you know, in front of our home, right? Common corridor. So when there's drain water, so the neighbor will sweep towards my side, my house, then my mom will sweep back. Well, it's like watching a tennis match, you know? Whoa. You know? Love your neighbor. Sometimes can be challenging. But wait. Love your enemy. Woo That's tough. But grace will teach you in the person of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. God will write His laws in your mind and on your hearts. It's not just about not envying someone. Right? Wow. Look at his. Wow, I wish I could have his house. Wow. I wish God have his car, one of his five cars. It's not about that. Love will, love will teach you to bless them. But, but he really has five cars. Why should I bless him with one matchbox car? You know? <laughs> he doesn't need a matchbox car. It's so small. But see that as sowing, right? Sowing into his life so that, you know, you will reap your own car in the future. <laughs> and you don't do that, right? For, for the motive of, of reaping something. Right? You give because you're generous. Because you want to bless someone. Right? That's why we bless. That's why we give. Grace will teach you. Amen? Praise the Lord. So it speaks of the Holy Spirit leading you and guiding you. Right? And then I will be their God and they shall be my people. Oh, that's so beautiful. Right? When God is your God and you His people, what does that speak of? It's not, no longer about rules and regulations. It's not, no longer about that hour, you know, the two hours, rules and regulations. It's about relationship. It's about relationship. When He's your God, and you are his people, it's about relationship. If he's your God and you need healing, he is your healer. If he's your God and you need provision, he is your provider. Amen. If he's your God and you need protection, he is your protector. Amen. He's your God and you are his people. It speaks of, I, I love the pronouns, you know, my people, my God. It speaks of possession. And, you, and we want to possess our possessions. We want to possess all that God has given us. All that Jesus has purchased for us at the cross. Amen? Praise the Lord. Alright? And the last one is so beautiful. Next. All shall know me. The actual verse. In the verse, uh, uh, next verse. After that. Alright, verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. All of them shall know me. And the first know, right? None of them shall teach his uh, neighbor or none his brother saying, Know the Lord. 
right? The first know is a, a Greek word that actually is uh, about knowing God, you know, in a, through effort, through experience, right? It takes effort. And in life, yes, it does take effort to know people. It takes effort to get to know your wife. It takes effort to get to know people beyond how are you. Because sometimes when people ask how are you, the answer actually should be, do you have time? <laughs> it's not fine, thank you. The truth be told, truth be told, right? The answer often is not fine, thank you. Thou shalt not lie. <laughs> right? Very often, very often when someone asks, right, how are you? A uh, fine, thank you. But actually many of us are lying, you know. Because it's not fine, there are things going on in our life, but we don't have time, right? We're not seated at a cafe, seated over a cup of coffee. But if you have time, I will share how am I, you know? Yeah, and we can pray together, right? So, so it's beyond just superficial greetings, beyond superficial how are you, right? But so, so this is the first no, right? The first no there is the Greek word, right? That, that talks about knowing through effort, knowing through experience. Right, but the second no, all shall know me, is the Greek word oiko, or aiko, right? Which is so beautiful, right? It speaks of intimacy. It speaks of knowing someone intimately. Oh, so beautiful. I love that, right? And, and, and it speaks of knowing someone intuitively and intimately. That is that second no. So all shall know me, intuitively and intimately. That's why it's no longer about rules and regulations. It's about relationship. And not just relationship, intimate relationship. And there's hope for all of us, from the least of them to the greatest. From the one who has only been a Christian for five minutes to the one who has been a believer for 50 years. From the one who has never served in any ministry to the one who has served the Lord for 50 years. From the least of them to the greatest, all shall know Him intuitively and intimately. That gives hope to all of us. There's, you know Him beyond rules and regulations. You know Him because it's a relationship with a loving Savior. It's a relationship with your Heavenly Father. And you want to know, and He wants you to know Him that way. Not to know Him through the rules and regulations, through the law. He wants you to know Him intuitively and intimately. Oh, that's so beautiful. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why at the cross, as you saw just now in that video, on that cross, He cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When he walked on this earth, he addressed God the Father as Father. Abba. But at the cross, because he was bearing all our sins, our sicknesses, our diseases, that's the first time and the only time. He cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God had to turn his back on his son at the cross because he was suffering the punishment and condemnation for all our sins. So that today, we can cry out to God, my Father, my Father, why have you so loved me? Why have you so blessed me? Why have you so provided for me? Oh, why have you so been, why have you so forgiven me of all my sins, even though I don't deserve it? Because Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can know God intimately and intuitively. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay, next. So the good news is the new covenant for those of us, when we look within and we are dis discouraged, disappointed, we feel hopeless, we feel helpless, that we cannot, we cannot, for whether we have for the best effort, all right, whether we give the best effort, we cannot fulfill our side of the bargain in cutting the covenant with God. We look inside, we're just, oh, I can't. But the good news is the new covenant is not contingent on your obedience, but Christ's obedience which he demonstrated at the cross. So does that mean we don't have to obey God's word? Of course not. When you know that God is so good, when you know God is so loving, when you know God is so gracious, why would you not want to obey Him? It's, it's those that think that, oh, so since I'm forgiven, right? Since oh, Christ is obedient, okay, I can do anything I want. That's not what the gospel is about. It's when you know how good God is. The Bible tells us it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God, you know. When He's good, when you experience His grace, His goodness, it will cause you to repent. First change your mind and right believing produces right living. Hallelujah. And when you know your Heavenly Father is a good, good Father, why would you not want to obey Him? Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? So, the good news is, 
the clause, the one clause that activates the three effects of the new covenant. The one clause is that because of Jesus' finished work at the cross, God the Father has now declared, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness, their sins and their lawless deeds, I'll remember no more. Only God can, can make himself remember no more. How, I don't know. I cannot explain it. Right? But because of the blood, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross, God has declared, I'll be merciful to your unrighteousness. Your sins, your lawless deeds, I remember no more. And that is what gives us the power to overcome sin. That's what gives us the power to reign in this life. Amen? Praise the Lord. All right, so how to remain? We are there. We are there already, you know. It's not, you're not, not trying to attain or trying to reach. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, right, you're already under the new covenant. But sometimes we don't know. Sometimes because of lack of knowledge, because of ignorance, because of you know, lack of teaching, right, we don't know where we are. But you're already there and you're already under the new covenant, whether you realize it or not. Right? So how to remain, how to abide, how to stay there. You know, sometimes you give instructions to people. Uh, okay, you, you stay there, huh? don't move. Huh? I'll be back, I'll come back later. Five minutes, I'll come back. Huh? Then you go off, you do something, you come back, they're gone. Right? Sometimes it can be a child, sometimes it can be an adult even. You tell them not to move, but then they wander away. Right? And, and it's no surprise that we are likened to sheep. Right? That the Bible likens us to sheep. And sheep tend to go astray somehow. They tend to go astray. But you know what? The good shepherd is so patient. The good shepherd is so kind. The good shepherd will leave the 99 just to seek that one lost one. Right? But it, it will benefit us to remain. Right? To abide and remain under the new covenant. Because you're already there. Alright? So how to remain? Well, very simple. This is the part where I ask for my, where's my bed? No, huh? I'll do an illustrative, uh, <laughs> right? I'll put a put a bed there and lie down for the next 10 minutes and then I'll illustrate this point, enter God's rest, right? So <laughs> it's not just about physical rest. Of course, that's important, right? It's not just about physical rest, right? But what does it mean to enter God's rest? Show them the verse. I think you are familiar with this verse, right? I, I love this verse. This is a, an invitation, right? That transcends time. This is an invitation that transcends space. Because this is invitation that the Lord extends to us all. Come to me, all you who are who labor and are weary and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he was talking to a group of people in the Old Testament, or rather in the in the Gospel of Matthew. All right, they were still under the law. All right, and he was talking to people who were laboring and heavy laden under the weight of the law, under the weight of the Ten Commandments. And he says, "Come to me, and I'll give you rest." Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and lowly in spirit and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So how do you remain under the new covenant? How do you enter into God's rest? Come to Him. Come to Him. Come to the Lord. How do, how do you come to the Lord? You come to the Lord in prayer. You come to the Lord in the Word. You come to the Lord worshipping Him. When he says, come to me, do we come to him? Do we take time to come to him? I know we have busy schedules. I know there are many things to do every day. But take time to come to the Lord and receive his rest. Because he says, I will give you rest, you know. So when he gives us rest, right, he has to be received. When someone gives you a present, some of them, they just put it on the table, right? Ah, take, it, take it yourself. No, no, no. But he gives you rest. And the best way, to appreciate Him, the best way to thank Him is to receive that rest and thank Him. So, so when He gives you rest, receive it. And He, and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find. So that's a uh, given rest, rest that is given, and then the next one is rest that is found. You will find rest for your souls. Right? You can find rest for your souls when you take your, His yoke upon you. Right, and I believe that uh, this illustration has been shared before, but for the purpose of uh, illustrating, can okay, I invite uh, Deacon David and Derek to come forward? Just very quickly. Okay. So these are ox number one, big ox. This is junior ox. All right. His name is Oliver, and his name is Oxley. All right. So, so this is the senior ox. Huh? So, so in, in the biblical times, right, because there's agriculture and all that, 
they want to train their ox to plow the land, right? So how do they train the junior ox? They need to train the younger ox. They yoke him together with the senior ox. Not senior, senior ox, all right? Senior ox, right? This is the senior ox. This is the junior ox. They are yoked together, all right? So when, 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 when the Lord says this, take my yoke upon you, he's referring to something that they understand, right? It's an illustration that they all understand because they live in, uh, you know, there's agriculture and all that during those times. So in order for the junior ox to learn from the senior ox, all right, I bow down, jump bow down a bit, okay? Okay, I'll start walking. Hey, must, must put your arm around him. Uh, yes, okay, yeah. All right, now they are yoked already, okay? Now, go. Okay. Deacon David, you decide, no? you're the senior ox. You want to go home also can. <laughs> go toilet, okay? All right, so, so all the junior ox has to do is to flow and allow the senior ox to lead him. Right, and that's what it means. the Lord means. Now, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. When you're yoked with him, you allow him to lead you and guide you. It is easy and it's light. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Usually burdens are heavy, but his burden is light. Amen? Because he's the one bearing it actually. Amen? Let's give him a hand. Praise the Lord. So, <laughs> that's how we enter into God's rest. Right? Come into his presence, worship him, pray, worship him, read the word. And just allow Him to lead us and guide us. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. Amen? So, serving the Lord actually is meant to be easy, you know. Because some, some of us say, oh, you know, I serve the Lord. You know, I remember in my previous church, you know, uh, there was this uh, couple that went to uh, the mission field. You know, they were missionaries. And um, when I found out where they went for missions, I wanted to follow them because they went to Hawaii. I said, oh. This couple went to Hawaii to suffer for the Lord. One year later, they came back, wow, with Hawaiian shirt, you know, Hawaiian outfit. I said, wow, they really look like they suffered for the Lord, you know. But they look very happy, you know. Then uh, other missionaries went to, wow, third world countries. This couple went to Hawaii. So I also felt, wow, I felt led to go to Hawaii for missions also, you know. So, right, but you know, that, that, that really happened, all right. But really serving the Lord, you know, sometimes you hear, it's like, wow, very stressful, very heavy, why well, I suffered for the Lord. There is some amount of suffering and usually it comes through persecution from the world especially, right? But you find that when you serve the Lord and you flow with Him, it is easy and it is light. It's supposed to be joyful. Like, for example, I'm here doing Grace Discovery, right? For the, for the Grace Academy. Right? Ah, yeah. To, uh, Tuesday evening to come and then... No. It's a joy for me. It's a joy. <laughs> and not just because there are people clapping, you know. Because I know there's like almost like 900 people watching from all over the world. And not just because of that as well. It's because you all are seeing Jesus and discovering His love and His grace. And when Jesus is glorified, Jesus is magnified, and His people are edified, oh, there's nothing more joyful for me as a pastor. Because He is the one who gets all the glory, not me, right? Not the cameraman, not Deacon David. It's Jesus who gets all the glory. And it's, it's easy. It's easy to talk about Him. It's easy to talk about His grace. It's easy to talk about His goodness. Because He's that good, He's that gracious. Easy to talk about Him. If I have to find things to talk about His goodness, wow, you know, actually, uh, mm, I can't remember a testimony, you know, but, but I think He's good. Uh. <laughs> no, but this is, He's really good. I've experienced it. Many of the people who have written in with their testimonies have, have experienced it. Many of you have experienced it. It's easy. It's light to serve the Lord. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, let's move on. So, uh, next. So, it's good to know, right? When you talk about rest, when you hear pastor preaching about rest or Pastor Lawrence or any one of the pastors preaching about rest, it's not about inactivity. Although there are times when it's good to really physically rest, right? And take a break. But when we talk about Bible rest, it is not inactivity. It is Holy Spirit directed activity that will cause it to be easy and light. When it's led by the Holy Spirit, and some people, they convince themselves, you know, that they are being led by the Holy Spirit. Then, three months after they start this business venture, they come to me for counselling. <laughs> say, Pastor, why? Why did God open the door only to slam it shut in my face? So when I counsel them, when I hear them, and especially when I listen to the wife, right, because when they started the business venture, right, they decided on their own. Then when the wife is there together with them for the counselling, ah, then I hear from, from the wife, yeah, it was, they convince themselves it's Holy Spirit-directed activity, Right? 
But I, but I tell him after hearing everything, I say, oh, actually, you know, the, the, the answer is very close to you, you know, sleeping beside you every single night. But why didn't you listen to her? <laughs> you know? so, so rest is Holy Spirit-directed activity. The Lord will lead you, the Lord will guide you, and very often, you'll be confirmed by the Bible and confirmed right, with godly counsel, your leaders and people who love you and care for you. And sometimes those who love you and care for you will say no. Sometimes love means saying no. Sometimes not all the time. Huh? Right? And, and that's, how you are, that's how the Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. Right? With confirmation through the Word. You will not contradict the Word. Right? And there will be confirmation right, through leaders who love you and care for you. And through those around you. Especially your spouse, I believe. Very often. The Lord leads you and guides you through the Word of your spouse. Like last week, the same couple, you know, the one who, the guy who doesn't like uh, durian. So, after two hours of counselling, right, I told him, actually, what I've just told you is what your wife has been telling all this while. Yeah, la, but I needed to hear from you, Pastor. So, yeah, but you guys save yourself two hours by listening to your wife, right? You come here to listen to me tell you what your wife has been telling you, right, for the past few years and have to summarise it in two hours. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so, you know, it's uh, just, just, just uh, very interesting, right? But nonetheless, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak into their life and speak into their marriage, right? And, you know, but the Holy Spirit directs you and guides you, you know, in, in very supernaturally natural ways. Sometimes you look for major signs, you know. Wow, there must be a snow in Singapore. It'll never happen. It'll never happen, right? Well, maybe one day it will, but so far I've not seen snow in Singapore, right? So, so, so it's not just about looking for all these signs, you know, but it's supernaturally natural through the people around you through people who love you and care for you. All right? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, so in closing, I just want to focus on uh, next. Uh, okay, uh, we can skip this verse. Next. On how we can really enter into God's rest and remain in God's rest by praying in the Holy Spirit. You know, when I say come into God's presence to in the Word, yes, it's great, all right? To come to God's presence, to worship Him, it's wonderful, right? To come to God's presence, to pray. But you know what? There's a very powerful prayer, a very powerful gift that God has given us. It's the very first gift that Jesus gave to the church on the day of Pentecost, when He ascended back to, after He ascended back to heaven. And He's praying the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us in uh, Isaiah in the Old Testament, right, that, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, this is the rest and this is the refreshing. Wow. This is the rest and this is the refreshing. And I can tell you this, as someone who prays in the Spirit, not as often as I should, I must admit, right? But when you pray in the Spirit, sometimes you feel physically, naturally speaking, thirsty, you know. After praying for five minutes, uh, you look, eh, hey, only five minutes. Uh. And then I say, wow, I feel thirsty already, you know. So, so don't go by the natural, don't go by emotions and what you feel. When he says this is the rest and the refreshing, it's not just physical. Right? I believe there will be physical benefits as well later. Right? But it, is, it starts with your soul. It starts with the condition of your heart. It starts with your spirit man. You're being rested on the inside. You're being refreshed on the inside. And that's what truly matters. You know, because when we pray and we ask God to calm all the storms in our life, whether it's a financial storm, whether it's a marital storm, whether it's a business storm, the real storm that he wants to come is not the ones on the outside. They will, they will resolve themselves many a times. The true storm that he wants to come, the primary storm that he wants to come is the one on the inside. And that's why he wants you to be at rest on the inside, in your soul, in your mind, in your emotions, in your heart. He wants you to be refreshed on the inside. And then you will see all the storms on the outside being calmed. Right? So praying the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, is the rest and it is the refreshing. And of course, we do not know what we are saying. Right? Because it is not, you know, it's heavenly language. And we don't have the verses in the notes or on the, or on the, on the screen, but I'll just uh, give them, uh, just, uh, you can just note down. All right? Uh, Jude, all right, the, uh, the book of Jude in the New Testament. There's only one chapter, right? Verse 20 to 21. Right? It says that when you pray in the Holy Spirit, you are building yourselves up in the most holy faith. So beautiful. Not just building yourself up, full stop, but building yourself up in the most holy faith. Wow. When you pray in the Spirit. All right? Jude, 
uh, chapter 1, which is the only chapter, verse 20. And then verse 21 goes on to say, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So beautiful. So you build yourself in the most holy faith and you keep yourself in the love of God. Wow, so beautiful. All right? And then in uh, Romans chapter 8, you can take note of Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 26 to 28. Also, it's a beautiful verse, a beautiful portion of Scripture. Right? Likewise, it says, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You know, where many a times we feel weak, right? And then it says, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. Sometimes we don't know what to pray, especially in our known language. We're so tired, we're so worried, we're so anxious. We just don't know what to say. We don't know how to pray even, right? But the Bible says, for we do not know how, what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Spirit Himself makes intercession for us, right? Yet it's not Him doing the work for you. It's a partnership. When you don't know how to pray, you don't know what to say, right? The Holy Spirit comes alongside you as your partner, right? He gives you the words to speak, but you are the one speaking the words, right? With, with help from the Holy Spirit, right? So beautiful, right? And then He says, For now he, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. So when you pray in the Spirit, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it's a partnership with the Holy Spirit, and we do not know what is the perfect will of God, right? But the Holy Spirit knows. All right, so when you pray in the Spirit, you are praying a beautiful and perfect prayer. But sometimes our head knowledge, our mind, if we know what we're actually praying, for example, I always say this, especially at uh, Blessed Draws, you know, you don't call it Lucky Draws, call it Blessed Draws, right? And then when it comes to the first prize, whatever that prize is, everyone is praying the Spirit. Shokataraba sukriantalama sukorobo shiriante. Mantaraba sukorobo They're claiming the first prize. But they don't realize that if you, if you translate it, you interpret it, oh, bless Brother Derek, Lord. Oh, he needs that iPad, Lord. He needs that iPad. So oh, he's been praying for the iPad. Bless him, Lord. But we think we are claiming it, you see? Right? So when you know, when your mind knows what you're actually praying, it's a perfect prayer because he really needs the iPad, right? And God knows. So you're praying for him without realizing it. Also, Pastor, why myself don't pray in the Spirit? No, you're, it's a blessing to pray for someone else, right? It's more, so, so don't just pray for yourself, pray for others as well, okay? Then, so it says, it's according to the will of God. And, then, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So we know that verse quite well. We know that all things work together for good. It comes after the part on praying the Spirit. So beautiful, right? So I just want to end before we partake of the Holy Communion. All right, for those of us, who have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I just want to give you an opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is already inside of you. He lives inside of you. But when you're baptized in the Spirit, it's like you jumping into a pool. You know, the Spirit lives inside of you, right? But when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's like you being baptized in the Spirit. It's, it's, oh, it's, it, can't, it, can't, it speaks of oneness, you know. The Spirit is in you and you are in the Spirit. Wow, He speaks of oneness. So the Holy Spirit is already inside of you. But you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? And the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit is by speaking in other tongues. All right? So for those of us who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit before you partake of the Holy Communion, I want to give you an opportunity. Whether you're here in person or whether you're watching on the screen, right? the baptism of the Holy Spirit transcends space, transcends time zone as well whatever time zone you're in, whether it's morning or evening. Right right now, it's uh, 9.15 here in Singapore, right? So at your, wherever you are, maybe some other time, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit transcends time, transcends time zones. And if you're worried, especially for those of you who are newer believers, if you're worried, what, what if, but I don't know what I'm saying, what if, what if I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I'm possessed by an evil spirit? Uh? How? Uh? Well, let me give you a couple of portions of scripture, all right? Um, Found in Matthew chapter 7, right? And Luke chapter 11. All right, Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, 7 to, uh, let me see which is a good one to, verses 7 to uh, 11, right? And uh, Luke chapter 11, 9 to 13. So it's about ask, seek, and knock, right? And then after that, the Lord says, if your son asks you for a bread, will you give him a stone? Think about it. If your son asks you for bread, which father in their right mind gives the son a stone? If your son asks you for fish, will you give him a serpent? 
it gets, it's actually quite a ridiculous example, you know. Your son asks for bread, which father will give the son a stone? Your son asks for fish, which father will give a snake? That's in Matthew. In Luke, there's another question. If your son asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? So bread, fish, egg, these are good food. Which father will give stone, serpent, and scorpion? So it says, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. In Matthew, it says, how much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask? In Luke, he says, how much more will your Father in heaven, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So the Lord is saying the same thing, you know, even though in two, the two different Gospels, the, the quotation is different. He's not, saying it, it's some, he's not contradicting himself. He's saying the same thing. Because the Holy Spirit, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit is a good thing. So if you being evil, and the word evil there in the Greek is a word that, that means you are easily irritable, annoyed, you know, like many of us fathers are. Like, very interesting, just, just when I was leaving my place just now, on the way here, I walked past my daughter who was back from school without realizing it. Then after a couple of steps, Daddy! <laughs> you know? so, I was in a, so I wanted to be here on time and all that. So she wanted a kiss and all that. So I was like, yeah, I mean, hurry up. I still kissed her, you know. But I must admit, the, the kiss wasn't a very willing and, you know, oh, you know? it was like, <laughs> go, uh, later I'll go back and kiss her properly, okay? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so... So if we are irritable, we are annoyed, you know, we are in a hurry, and we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will our perfect Father in Heaven give good things, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So don't be afraid. If you ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you won't be possessed by an evil spirit. Alright? Okay, so right now, just want to invite you to stand wherever you are. And even at home, if you can, please stand with us. And for those of you who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to pray a prayer. Alright, and... At the end of the prayer, I'm going to count to three. And I just want you to open your mouth. If you've never been baptized in the Spirit, you've never spoken in other tongues, all right, I want you to open your mouth and by faith, all right, speak in other tongues. All right, your mind will battle. You know, you, you'll be, you, your mind will battle you and say, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're talking nonsense and all that. But if uh, we've prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe that there's a prayer that God answers, right? And there's a prayer that God definitely hears and answers above and beyond what you can ask or imagine. Amen? Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this Grace Discovery class this evening. And I ask, Lord, that through this one hour plus, that your Son, our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ, has been magnified and glorified. And Father, we thank you that the very first gift that our Lord gave us after His death, His burial, His resurrection, and ascension back to heaven, the very first gift that He gave to His beloved church on the birthday of the church, on the day of Pentecost, was the gift of tongues, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidence by the speaking of other tongues. So right now, Father, we know, Lord, that this is the rest and the refreshing we know, Lord, that we build ourselves in the most holy faith when we pray in the Spirit. We know that when we do not know what to pray as we ought to, the Holy Spirit helps us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And we thank you, Lord, that when we pray in the Spirit, we are praying perfect prayers according to your will. So right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, every son, every daughter of God under the sound of my voice, for those who have yet to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit right now, receive, be filled till overflowing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit and begin to speak in other tongues. Or begin to experience the rest and the refreshing. Begin to experience what building yourself in the most holy faith is all about. Or begin to pray perfect prayers according to the will of God as the Spirit gives you utterance right now in the mighty name of Jesus, receive it. And at the count of three, let's just lift up our voices and let's just pray in the Holy Spirit. One, two, 
Three. Hora ma shoka taraba so kriyanta la maso para basi karai. Hora ma santa raba so ke teriyanta la maso. He ke teriyanta la maso ko toro boshi ka taraba santa raba kuriyante. Mambarara raba so ko toro mo he keriyanta la maseriyanto. Hora bara basi ka taraba la halala basu kora ma hanta la basu kriyanda. Mara basho ko toro boso ko toro mo she keriyante. Ko ranta la basi ke teri besho raba santa raba ko. Mara basi ka taraba so ko toro mo hante. Kira na la la basi katala maso kiriante, manta la baso kiriante, ho ra basi kiriante, ko ra baso priante, ho ra maso triante, ho ma ra baso kiriante. You can low your volumes. You can pray softly. Ko ra baso para basi kiriante, manta ra baso katala baso. You can even pray under your breath. Ko ra baso katala baso, kita ra baso priante, manta ra baso. By show of hands, how many of you here received the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the first time? Just raise your hands. Anyone? Those at home, I can't see your hands. <laughs> All right. Anyone? All right. If you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're speaking in tongues for the first time. Congratulations. Continue speaking. Don't worry. All right. Don't worry about what the next syllables or the next syllable or syllables will be. All right. Continue speaking, and the Spirit will give you the words. The, the Spirit will give you the syllables to utter. All right. Praise the Lord. Come, let's just pray in the Spirit again. Shora basuka tarama santor boriante. Mara baso kutoro basu kriyanta lama santor bakiriai. Ke kriyanta lama so kutoro bushante. Kora bashanta lama so karabarai. Manta lama se katara baso. Ke kriyanta lama so. And if you feel like singing the Spirit, you can sing in the Spirit as well. Shora da 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 baso. He da 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 lama so. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can increase the volume. You can decrease the volume. You can pray under your breath. Amen. Praise the Lord. Continue praying the Spirit throughout the week. Hallelujah. Right now, let's just receive communion. Let's just partake of the Holy Communion in remembrance, in remembrance of our Lord and our Savior, of His finished work at Calvary's cross. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night He was betrayed, He took the bread, He gave thanks, and He broke it. And said, take it, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So know that His body was broken in love for you, so that you might walk in divine health and wholeness all the days of your life. As we do it, do it not in remembrance of your sickness, your disease, your physical condition, your symptom, even though it's there, even though the doctor's report is there, do it in remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do it in remembrance of the one who has healed you. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. Do it in remembrance of Him. Hallelujah. So right now, let's just, in our own words, give thanks to Him. Thank Him for all that He has done. Thank Him for His goodness. Thank Him for His grace. Thank Him for healing you of every sickness, every disease, every pain, every discomfort. Hallelujah. And see Him bearing your sickness. See Him bearing your pain. See Him bearing your affliction. See Him bearing all that pain on His own body at Calvary's cross. Hallelujah. And before we partake, let us declare, Lord Jesus, by Your stripe, I am healed. I love you, Lord. Amen. Let us eat. As you hold a cup in your hands, know that this cup is the new covenant established in the blood of God's own Son. And that God is a faithful God always faithful to his covenant always faithful to his word always faithful to his promises which are yes and amen in Christ Jesus so as you drink of this cup be conscious that all your sins are forgiven be conscious that you he has made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus be conscious that the Lord your God 
is a covenant-keeping God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And all your needs are met at the cross of Calvary. In Jesus' most wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let us drink. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Have you been blessed? Yes. Praise the Lord. I have been greatly blessed. You've been a wonderful congregation. And even those of you watching online as well. You know, it's not just those who are live, they are just drawing it out, out of me. Right? I believe that those of you watching at home, wherever you are, right, you are also drawing it out. And I believe that you are, you know, wherever you are, you've been greatly blessed. Just receive, continue. You know, if those of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, continue praying the Holy Spirit. Right? Every single day, every single night. Of course, you're in public, in public transport, in the office. Pray softly beneath your breath. All right? All right? Praise the Lord. I'll hand the time over to uh, Deacon David for some announcements. Okay, um, be gently seated. We'll just take about two minutes more. How many of you are appreciative of uh, Pastor Gabriel? Yeah. He hurried here, gave a peck on the daughter's cheek, and came here and just served the food joyfully. So we appreciate you, Pastor Gabriel. We pray that you uh, have a good wet kiss for your daughter tonight. <laughs> Amen. Okay, just some announcements uh, before we go off. Uh, so maybe we can show them the first slide. So, there is a part two. I hope that all of you are coming for part two next week. Same time, same place. And this is the QR code to scan to ask questions. So, it will close at uh, tomorrow, 12 p.m. Singapore time. I really want to encourage you to scan the QR code, put it at, the, at your bookmark or something, and ask questions along the way. Like what Pastor Gabriel said in Matthew 7, 7, Ask and you shall find. Seek, oh sorry, ask and it shall be uh, given to you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it will be given to you. Okay, so just certainly really encourage you to ask questions. Uh, we encourage you to ask questions uh, relevant to the topic. So um, there are some questions that it's fun to ask, but it's not useful for all eternity. For example, it's not useful to ask Pastor Gabriel, eventually, right, how many times do you take a driving test? That whole thing will only be a fun fact. But what would be interesting is like, Pastor Gabriel, how do you cultivate an intimate relationship with God? Right? How, when you say grace teachers, what do you mean by grace teachers? Whatever that can aid you in your spiritual growth, I really want to encourage you to ask. Okay? Now, the second thing is, uh, next week when you come, uh, Pastor Gabriel will also be praying over for uh, what we call the anointing oil. So we can take any oil, right, uh, olive oil, so whether it's cooking oil, whether it's the um, Watson's, uh, not Watson's, for those overseas people in the pharmacy, you might buy olive oil for moisturizing your skin and all that. Just buy the oil, put it into a small bottle or a big bottle and just bring it, whether you're at home, whether you're over here, Pastor Gabriel will be praying over that as well. Amen. Okay, so that's the end of the announcement, but I have one precious uh, tip to just uh, pass you. So I find it very precious, right? Um, so what's the name? Roger, Roger, can you just pass me this uh, notebook over here? Yep. I find it very precious when Pastor Gabriel is sharing and people are taking out their physical notebooks or their physical Bibles to write inside. And I just want to encourage you, right, in coming for services or classes, um, thank you, thank you, Roger, right, take a notebook, take a physical Bible out of digital back to the days of just writing to the Lord and reading the Bible to the Lord. So I, I just want to share with you how do I write to the Lord, right? I write to the Lord by saying like, okay, when Pastor Gabriel is sharing, I'll be like, Lord, Pastor Gabriel shares such a good word about cultivating a relationship with you. And I want that for myself. So I'll be talking intimately with God because now we're under a new covenant. It is a living relationship. And then Pastor Gabriel will say like, Matthew 7 and Luke 11, what does it say? Um, God will give you the good and perfect gift. And then in, in Luke 11, it is the Holy Spirit. Wow, that speaks to me. The good gift that the Heavenly Father gives me is the Holy Spirit. Lord, I want to treasure the Holy Spirit. I'll just write it down. The Bible comes alive and your relationship comes alive when you go back and open up your notebook and your Bible and you'll find God speaking to you. So I want to encourage you to uh, get a Bible, get a physical notebook, and we'll see you next week. Have a blessed evening. Thank you.